just bada bing bada bam. Welcome back to this week's episode of Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder. And today we're in New York City where the weather is chilly. It's about to snow in New York. But it is so freaking cold. So I decided I'm not going out today. I want to stay home and I'm going to be baking some chocolate mochi cookies. So that's mm -hmm. what we're doing while I tell you guys a very spooky story. Have you guys ever seen the movie Nightmare Alley? This was one of the best movies I've watched this year. First of all, the visuals are incredible. They're great, but the story itself was fascinating. There is so much going on, but it doesn't make it seem like there are a lot of loose plot ends. Does that make sense? Mm. Sometimes when movies cram in too much in two hours, so many things go unsaid, so many things don't get resolved, and you're ended up feeling like, why did I get emotionally involved with these characters when I don't know what the hell is going on? Well, this, this you feel satisfied. It's the question of what happens when you join a traveling carnival thinking that you were destined for greatness. You literally get a job as a mentalist. Do you know what that is? Mentalist? Yeah. No. It's people who mess with other people's minds. Like you? So, <laughs> are you saying I mess with your mind, be it? <laughs> I'm like, no, honey, I didn't need a macaron. You must be imagining things. <laughs> that wasn't me. I'm gonna actually go eat the first one now. No, it's thinking that you can manipulate people out of their money by making them believe that you can talk to ghosts, talk to spirits, see their future, read their minds. Hmm. But what if you're the one being manipulated all along? You just had no idea. You don't see it. The carnival owner and everyone around you is using you to get what they want. And in the end, well, You'll see what happens. It's quite the mind trick, really, this whole movie. So with that being said, let's get started. I'm actually gonna be starting to mix these ingredients in this bowl together. So sugar and milk. This is oat milk. Ooh. And then the melted butter. We're gonna crack the egg. Beautiful! The movie opens strong with a guy named Stan, and Stan is actively dragging a dead body into this old, broken down home. He's wrapped the body up in these blankets, so you have no idea who this dead person is. He drops the dead body in the middle of this living room in this random, broken down home and lights the whole thing on fire. Like, Stan is not here to play. The whole movie opens with murder. So he's here to get his business done, get back on the train, and head back home. Now, where is home, you wonder? Well, he hopes that it's the carnival, the traveling carnival. The good old carny is what they call it. It's called the greatest carnival in the world. That's their tagline, but it looks spooky. It's not like the state fair these days. It's even more spooky. I'm talking the red and white tents. The, they, they have to have open flames to keep the heat. They have people setting up, setting down. This is taking time in um, like the 60s, or the 70s, right? It's a different time back then, and I love the environment. It seems unsafe. It's more on par with American Horror Story. Like, use mm. that. They actually have a carnival at the American Horror Story, the American yeah. Horror Story Freak Show. Yeah, imagine yeah. that in your head. There is a man on stage leading a crowd of people into a bunker of sorts, or like an arena. Where Wait, so Stan works at the carnival? No, not yet. So at this carnival, because it's a traveling carnival, a lot of locals will go there looking for temporary work. The temporary work typically means, hey, I'm gonna help you deassemble the carnival, load it onto your truck, and then you travel to a new carnival state. And then they find locals to help deassemble the tents and assemble the tents. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he's hoping he can be one of those locals. Now, he gets there and of course he's looking for the owner of the carnival and everyone points to this stage where there's a man and it's almost like an arena. So at first he's on stage and then the doors behind him open, they slide open and there's this banister, this railing that you can walk towards and when you get to the edge of the railing, you look down and it looks like a two-story drop and there's just hay at the bottom. It's a circle, there's no escape. It's almost like looking down a rabbit hole and the man, the owner says, Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to remember that this exhibit is presented solely in the interest of science and education. Where did it come from, you ask? Is it a beast or is it a man? Come on in and come on in and find out. The creature has been examined by the foremost scientists of both Europe and the Americas and has been pronounced a man, unequivocally a man. The audience rushes near the railing and they're they're looking down. It's almost like um what you would imagine a bullfight would take place, but much smaller, much, much smaller, right? Mm -hmm. And the doors swing open down there, and inside, in this little sectioned off stage, is a man hunched over, just 
writhing in pain and dried blood is all over his body. The presenter continues. He can go weeks without food nor drinks and lives entirely on the atmosphere. But you're in luck. Because tonight, we are going to feed him one last time. There will be a slight additional charge for this attraction, but no worries. It's not a dollar. It's not 50 cents, but a quarter. One-fourth of a dollar, and you will see him feed. And he dramatically walks over to a cage of live chickens. He will suck on the blood of reptiles like a baby feeding its mother's milk. And dramatically... He drops the live chicken down in the middle, and the man jumps after the chicken, grabbing it, holding it close to his body, almost as if he's, like, trying to protect this chicken, while mumbling to the crowd. He's looking up, and he's mumbling things, and the crowd is, like, ooing and aahing at this guy. And then, finally, he looks at the owner of the carnival, and there's just this darkness in this guy's eye. Which guy? The guy down there. Okay. And before... He waits, and then he painfully decapitates the chicken and sucks the blood from its neck. Yikes. I don't know. Maybe the guy is being held and starved. Like, what the hell? But what is this? Even Stan the Killer, who just lit a dude on fire, who just murdered a guy, seems a little repulsed by this whole presentation. But he ends up getting a job at the Carney, so... I guess that's great. Not as a performer, but like I said, you know, the people that set up the tents and then deassemble the tents. Yeah, that's what he's doing. So he's helping them pack up and moving to a different location. He's doing this all in the rain, in a trench coat and fedora. I mean, the flair, the drama, it's wild. They have to take down all the tents, tie it up, board it onto a truck. And normally, people don't travel with the carnival from set to set because, you know, you have a family, you have everything going on in this place. They will usually just get the money for you know that day right that day of work but for some reason the owner of the carnival asks Stan to join them in the next carnival if he has nothing else to do they'll even throw in a hot meal for him which he's super excited about so he's really just not doing well like he needs shelter he needs food and all of that and he's scarfing down this meal when all hell breaks loose the geek is out there screaming that's what they call him, the geek. I guess they're not calling him the freak. I guess, I don't know, it's weird. They're calling him the geek. They're like throwing flashlights at each other, blowing into their whistles like, the geek is loose, the guy is loose, the monster is loose. Yeah, the chicken decapitator is loose. So Stan gets thrown a flashlight and he starts looking for this loose man slash monster slash geek. And he's told, if you see him, don't try to take him on your own. And he's running through the fun houses, the creepy houses with the movie tunnels, like the red and white stripes that are moving and the mirrors. And there's this giant eyeball display, literally a giant eyeball. And then it'll blink creepily. There's a mm. giant animated skull that opens for you to walk through. And without the music, the screams of the other adults, like the smells of freshly popped popcorn, this place is fucking creepy. It's so creepy. So he has his flashlight and he's searching, searching. And boom, he finds him in the fun house. You know, he's shining his flashlight and he's trying to keep calm because everyone told him, don't take the geek on by yourself because you're asking for trouble. And he just says, hey, look, man, they're coming for you. You got to come out. Listen, I'm not trying to hurt you. You didn't do nothing to me. The guy is hunched over mumbling. I'm not like this. I'm not like this. He keeps saying, I'm not like this. And before... Stan can do anything. This guy grabs a rock and slams it onto Stan's head. And Stan pulls his leg, gets him down, tackles him onto the ground, and hits him on the head twice with a stick before the carnival owner rushes over and he's like, Stop it! Jesus, you're going to kill him! Oh yeah, as if the carnival's not doing that already to this man. They throw the unconscious geek back into a giant cage that's lined with hay, and the owner of the carnival offers Stan a longer full-time job. He's like, we want you to come from state to state, not just the next town, but for a lot of towns. Hmm. And Stan looks a little bit hesitant because, like I said, the geek just got loose and everyone was chasing after him, but, the, you know, the carnival owner is trying to convince him, listen, folks here... They don't care what you've done in the past or even who you are. Let me know if a steady job interests you. That's all. So Stan wakes up the next morning, seeing everyone washing up before getting started. He sees people, you know, practicing their bits, tap dancing, playing guitar, contorting their bodies into all these fun and strange poses. It really does look like a place for people looking for a place to make money. Mm -hmm. and to get away from society. Like, try not to get judged. Like, that's the type of environment. Even though their whole job is people coming in and judging them, 
It's just, you know, they're kind of united together. So that morning, Stan runs into this woman named Zena, a clairvoyant who likes to read cards. She's married to this old guy named Pete, and the two of them do this mind reading show. But it's clear, Zena is not that into her husband. I mean, she is and she isn't. Like, there is this deep underlying love for her husband that Zena has that is unbreakable. But he's old, he's off his game. It seems like she's kind of into Stan's younger buffer dude physique. She even lets him use her bathtub in their house trailer and asks if he wants to help them out in their show. Hmm. Is the husband around? Yeah, Pete actually likes Stan. Pete is what? like, yeah, Pete is even saying, yeah, maybe you can help us work on our audience, on our show. And Stan's like, what do you mean? What do, what do I have to do? Zena's like, ah, nothing about it. You know, the carny speaks like a song. We sound Southern to Southerners. We sound Western to Westerners. And yeah, you could work for us. You could work our show. And on your downtime, maybe Pete can show you a trick or two. You'll do just fine. You got the, you got the panache. What is that? Oh, you're easy on the eyes and you're trouble. No, I'm not. Well, you're a maybe. And maybes, they're really bad for me. And she reaches into the bath and starts fondling his two carnies. Wait. Oh, yeah. She's... Oh, yeah. Carnival stress balls. Got it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, and they're making out, okay, and it's a lot. Maybe she saw it in her cards that she was going to have an affair with Stan, so might as well start now and not push off the inevitable. I don't know what she was thinking. They're humping and grumping when the carnival starts. And um, there's this guy named Bruno whose sign says he's the strongest man on earth. And you can see with each show there's lights, drama, colorful signs, theatrics. But behind the scenes, they all fucking hate working here. Like when they get on stage, they're like, Today, I'm the strongest man on earth and I'm going to lift. And then the minute that they get off stage, they're fucking smoking a cigarette and they're like, these fucking losers. Uh, my knees fucking hurt. <laughs> and they hate the people that are paying to watch them do whatever they claim to do. So Stan is going around in a suit and fedora collecting questions in a hat for Xena. So Xena's up in stage and she's got the whole outfit down to the T. She looks like a clairvoyant. And the audience, they're writing down questions about their lives and they want Xena to answer their questions. They write their name on the card, they write their question on the card, they put it into Stan's little bucket. And when he's done collecting them, he runs under the stage and starts reading them one by one and gives one of them specifically to Pete, the husband. So the husband is under the stage. The old guy is under the stage, right? And it's like this wooden boarded ceiling and there's just hay on the ground and he starts writing on a whiteboard. It's very specific words. And Zena's on stage. She gets the basket, the fake basket of questions, right, from Stan. He's like, here you go, I just collected these. And she puts them into this big, like, gold bowl. And she covers it in vodka and lights the whole thing on fire. From the audience's perspective, she has never read the cards. She didn't even really touch the cards, nothing. She just transferred it from one bowl to another and then lit that shit on fire. She should know nothing of what is in those cards. She said that lighting them on fire releases them into the world for her to connect with. So how does she communicate with Pete that's under the stage? Under her podium and under her dress, there is a glass opening. And Pete is under there placing a chalkboard with the words for her to look at that says, Abigail worried about her mom. <laughs> and so she looks down. She's got her hand to her head. I'm seeing that. Ooh, I'm seeing that someone here is worried about, about her mom. And, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing an A, an A in the crowd. Uh, yes, that, that's me, that's me. Is your name Abigail? Ooh. Abigail gasps and the whole crowd is clapping. Meanwhile, Pete is too drunk or too delirious to get the next card that Abigail wrote or even just the next person in the crowd. So Zena has to play it by ear and she's improv so she's kind of dragging it along. Ah, yes, I knew that because I just saw it in my head. Meanwhile, she's waiting for the next shit to show up in the blackboard, but Pete is passed out under the stage. The husband is yes, passed out? Yes, because he's getting drunk these days. He's lost what? his touch. This used to be their gig. He used to be amazing. He's the one that actually came up with all of this. All you and now need he's to do drunk. is uh, stay sober. 
sober or stay awake. Yes, just stay awake. <laughs> you don't even have to stay sober, really, for this yeah. one. He didn't even he didn't lose touch. He just lost his consciousness. Yeah, pretty much. So Zena has to play it by ear, and Abigail is begging for her to tell her more, and the rest of the crowd is like urging, like, yes, tell her more, tell the poor lady more about her mom. So Zena just takes a random guess. I see, you have a couple of siblings. No. Just one sister. No more siblings? Oh, uh, my brother, but he died. Ah, yes! That's what threw me. Because he's right here, right now. In the crowd, his hand is on your shoulder. Can you feel it? Yes! Oh my god! I felt something! I felt his hand! Oh my god, Harry! Papa! <laughs> and the whole crowd bursts into applause. Later that night, Zena and Pete and now stand. They're eating dinner in their living room and Zena and Pete's trailer and the old woman, Abigail, had followed them there to ask them more questions. Zena claimed that she told Abigail the truth, that she just took a guess. She had to do it for the crowd. She's sorry that she did that. It was just for the show. Because Pete had missed a cue, you know? But that confused Stan. He's like, I don't see why you didn't just keep going with it. Or why'd you tell her? No. You never do a spook show. Nothing good comes out of a spook show. I mean, is it so bad to give people hope? It ain't bad if it's a lie, Stan. Zena and Pete have a moment where they seem to be in love, just reminiscing about their time in Paddy, where they perfected their act, their words, everything. Apparently, Pete back then was the best mentalist out there, and he was damn good before he started getting drunk. So Stan's like, well, can you still do it, Pete? Sure, Stan. Give Zena an article, any article, an object that means something to you. Will you add more and mix? Pete turns around and closes his eyes, putting his hands in the air, moving around like this, shuffling his feet as if he's searching for the answer in his mind. And meanwhile, Stan passes Zena his watch. And Zena clears her throat. <clears> throat> Professor, please concentrate on the article I have in my hands. What can you tell me? Wrist watch, leather band, brass not gold, old and very old, worn down, but it's full of meaning. And it wasn't yours originally, was it? You took it. You stole it, didn't you? I see an older man and the boy hates him. The boy would like to be loved, but he hates that man. And then Pete sits down aggressively and stares into Stan's face. There's a death and a wish of a death. And Stan starts getting emotional. He says he, he loved that watch. That was his pride. My father. Was it now? No, 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 that's it. I'm done, I'm done, okay? So it's confusing, is it a scam or not? Or maybe it's true and he hates it because he hates having such power. It seems like, it seems like Pete is doing really well at this. And then he brings out a journal and shows it to Stan. It's all here, you see? Each word has a number and each number leads you to a different word. What? When Zena says, Professor, please concentrate on the object I have in my hand, each word means something. Police and object correspond with 21. Emphasis on concentrate, which means worn or battered or cheap. And I'm assuming 21 leads to wristwatch. So every word that she says, like, mm -hmm. instead of please focus, she uses concentrate. And then the combination of please and concentrate lead to a different number, which lead to it's a wristwatch. Mm. Or to a word that says gold. Mm. Or if she calls him teacher or something else, it would lead to a different word. Or mm. a combination of teacher and concentrate would lead to a different word. Wow. Interesting, That's no? how they do it, huh? That's how they do it, right? Yeah. But Pete says, you know, you still have to know how to read the mark. You gotta know how they dress, how they walk. People are desperate to tell you who they are. They're desperate to be seen. Hmm. Well, how do you know if you got them hooked? Well, you pause a moment. And they're hooked. How, how did you know about my father, though? Oh, that's a stock read. It's a black rainbow, you know, one size fits all. Thrifty but generous, private but friendly, you hated him but loved him. Everyone has a past, a shadow from their past, and usually for a boy, it's their father. Now, if the mark is a little bit older, you say, you've had some loss recently. But younger man is always the father. What? And with that, 
Pete goes to turn in their earnings to Clem, the boss of the carnival, and Clem convinces him to grab a bottle to drink, which Xena clearly doesn't like. Like, this guy's getting drunk all the time. But um, Clem, the owner of the carnival, claims that he will keep it their secret. I don't know, maybe that's why Pete lost his touch because he's constantly getting drunk and losing the next cue. And that night, Stan goes to Clem to drop off a pig's head in a glass bottle with a bunch of liquid. A what? A pig's head in a glass bottle. Why? I don't know. Someone was like, hey, can you go drop this off to Clem? Oh, wow. <laughs> and he's shown this whole room with a bunch of submerged things in glass bottles. And one of them is this freaking baby, like a full-size baby that looks stitched together like a Frankenstein baby. What? And Stan is like, what the heck? And then he meets a woman named Molly who electrocutes herself over and over on a stage. She doesn't seem to be in pain by it. And I also wonder if it's like an optical illusion or something because, I mean, that's a lot of electricity. That night, while Stan is falling asleep, he hears the moans and the groans of the geek. And he walks over to give the geek a puff of his cigarette through the bars. This guy's just being a friendly helper to everyone. Yeah. First the mentalist, then Xena, then, you know, the monster, and now Clem, and then now Molly. So he runs up to Molly, the beautiful girl that gets electrocuted. She's very pretty, she's got this brunette hair, and she goes on stage on like a kind of sexy outfit and, you know, electrocutes herself. I get the whole appeal, like that would kill it on OnlyFans. And now, he runs up to her, and he's so excited. He's got a stack of papers, and he's like, Molly, Molly, I, I, got, a, I got something to show you. You know how in your show you tell a cute little story, and then you electrocute yourself? And it's great, it's great. But what about this? What if you get an electric chair? Someone straps you in it, and everyone's confused, like, what's going on here? And all of a sudden, someone comes out with an executioner's hood on, and they pull the lever. And everyone's worried that you're going to be dead. But boom, you come back. Now I'm getting my little baking sheet. So he helped me pipe it in, or put it into this piping bag. And I'm going to get into a baking sheet and do the little squiggles, like up, down squiggles, until it's kind of long, like an eclair. Let me focus for a second, because I'm nervous. Is it not beautiful? It kind of looks like poo. But my poo, it looks beautiful. She's flipping through the book where he drew all of this, like the executioner's chair and everything. And she says, wow, you drew me? Yeah, I mean, I, I just draw what's on my mind. I always have, um, yeah, I just like to draw. I, I used to win a bunch of drawing contests when I was young, but not anymore. But I'm telling you, I think it'll be a great show. Yeah, it would, but nothing's really the best of anything around here. Yeah, well, you're better than this place. Maybe you think I'm special, but I'm not. Well, maybe I see something in you that you don't see, and I mean, it's possible. Yeah, but maybe all of this is good enough for me. I don't believe you. If it's not good enough for me, it sure ain't good enough for you. Think about the idea, okay? And he runs off, right? So all of a sudden, he's just into this girl. She's very pretty, so he wants to date her. He wants to help her with this executioner's chair. He wants to help execute her. And with enough time, Stan makes Molly an executioner's chair, fit with a lever to pull, smoke machines, displays of the electricity in the back. I mean, it is professional, like a Disney set. How did he even have time to make it? I have no idea, but he does. And Molly tests it out, and she's instantly in love with the chair and with Stan. It's great, right? They're oddly romantic together. They start dating, and suddenly this story is turning into a romance at the carnival. And that night, Stan finds Molly sitting on the carousel with the lights are on. And she's sitting on a horse, leaning her head up against the pole. He's like, what are you still doing out here? I had a dream, and I couldn't go back to sleep. Do you want to tell me about it? Sure, it was my dad. Oh, is he, did he pass? He was alive and smiling in my dream and I don't really like to smile, but I would smile for him. He could charm his way out of anything. Tell me more about him, about you. What about me? I know you like chocolate and I know you like to read. And dancing, I like to dance, but it's been a while. Yeah, well, we can fix it. And they start dancing. Okay, it's like a whole romance. They start dancing on this carousel, and they're dancing through the horses, and they turn round and round, and I'm thinking, you know, what the hell is going on? Why is this even on? Do they not care about the electricity off hours? Carnivals are pretty stingy, no? So Molly's like, I'm thinking about what you said. That we can do better, Stan? Where would we go? 
Where is better than here? What if I told you I could get a two-man act for us? What kind of act? The kind that would get us headlining in the biggest hotels and showrooms from the East Coast to the West Coast. You're bigger than this place, Molly, and if you let me, I want to give you this place and everything in it. And as they're about to kiss, Molly jumps off the carousel and heads back to her trailer. But she's not upset. She's smiling in her bed when she gets in. And Stan's about to chase after her, but the head boss Clem, he wants his help. The monster man has a wound on his head, and the flies got into it, and now he's infected. The fever won't come down. So the two of them drag the unconscious geek to the doctor and leave him at the door in the pouring rain. The head boss clearly doesn't care if this man lives or dies, right? And the two of them go out to eat as if they didn't just leave someone for dead. And while they're at the restaurant, Stan asks the head boss, how do you know who's a geek? Like, how do you, how do you push a guy to get to that point? Well, it wasn't easy, I'll tell you that. You get a real drunkie, a real, a real alky, likes alcohol, a bottle a day type of fool. Where do you pick him up? Nightmare alleys, train tracks, flop houses, you name it. Lots of folks come addicted to booze, poppy, opium, but you, you, you reel them in with the booze. You tell them, I got a little job for you. It's temporary, just till we get ourselves another geek. And then you spike their alcohol, one drop a bottle, with opium. Yeah. And then he thinks he's in heaven. And you say to him like this, well now, I gotta get myself a real geek, okay? And he, he doesn't want to stop because he wants the alcohol, so he'll say, well, well I, and I doing okay? Am I not good enough? And then you say, like crap you doing okay. You can't draw a real crowd. Faking a geek? Mm-mm, everyone knows. And you walk away. Now that night, you drag it out, you lay it on thick. Meanwhile, he's sobering up, he's getting the shakes, the terrors. You get him to soak up that feeling, and then you throw him the chicken. He'll geek. Meaning, he'll decapitate the chicken and eat it. Now, back to the car, and this, this conversation is important later, so just remember it. Back to the carny. Pete is teaching Stan all of his skills, even with his hand motions. So you stand there left hand in the air as if you're plucking a feather out of thin air. Then right hand at your temple. You know, it's you're asking the universe for colors, textures. Stan's like, you got a real gift, you know, Pete, to be, to be able to entertain all these people. If you're good at reading people, it's mostly because you've learned as a child, staying one step ahead of everything is, is good. They're screaming in the distance, and Pete says, oh shit, Clem must be breaking in the new geek. At this rate, he must be half out of his mind by now. Anyway, Stan, my boy, do you mind grabbing me a pint of the sugarcane liquor? Just close your eyes and go to sleep, Pete. It's late. But Pete urges him to get more. So Stan goes to get a pint of the liquor, essentially stealing it from the big boss. And when he gets back, Pete is asleep. So he puts the pint of liquor down and he sees Pete's book, his know-all, be-all book next to him. And he goes to peek at it a little. But Pete wakes up and grabs his arm. Stan, what are you doing? Sorry, I didn't mean any harm. I was just curious. Stan, this book can be misused. That's why I stopped doing these acts. I got shut eye. Do you know what that is? It's when a man starts believing his own lies. He starts believing that he has power. He has shut eye. And people are going to get hurt. Good people. And then you lie and lie. And when the lies end, there is the face of God staring straight into your soul. No matter where you turn, no matter anywhere you go, no man can outrun God, Stan. No man. Yes, sir. And with that, Stan leaves while Pete gets into his liquor. Stan starts practicing the look, the face, the hand motions all night, everything. And for a while, everything is great until it isn't. What's in that book? All the words, the number to the words. Oh, I thought he was teaching him. Um, not all of it. Like, that's almost like the encyclopedia. So he's yeah. teaching him the basics. Yeah. 
but not everything. Yeah. Okay. And he wants that act, right? Because he's telling Molly that they can have a two-man show, right? Anyways, everything's going great. You get the montage of the cute little carnival acts until boom, Pete is dead. Pete was found what? dead. It's mysterious. We don't know what happened to Pete. We can only assume. And Xena is sobbing over his dead body. He had drunken himself to death, is what people believe. But the show must go on. So that night, they have another carny show, and the police roll up to shut that shit down. Whether they found the geek in the rain or someone reported it, I mean, it's about time, yeah? So Stan runs to tell Clem about it, and he's got a whole setup for how to get away with the geek. Because the minute the police lay eyes on the geek, they're done. The carny is shut down, game over, because the geek is not supposed to be a part of the show. Everybody is a willing participant, everybody gets paid, the geek does not. He's being held hostage, essentially. They even have a string that they pull and it covers the geek monster man like presentation poster with another one and the sheriff rolls in angry. We will shut this shit down one way or another. You guys are you guys are emphasizing cruelty to both animal and man and you young lady and he points at Molly who's in a skimpy outfit tied to the execution chair. And you, you are doing a great job. And keep doing you babes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, and you, young lady, we've got wives and daughters in this town. You are under arrest for indecency. Someone get her down. <sighs> Stan runs in. Sir, sir, stop. The electric current has got, has got to go somewhere, somewhere. It's all wound up in the machine. If you touch her, you will die. And with that, they pull the lever. The electricity goes into Molly. The smoke machine goes off. She starts writhing, and Molly pretends to be in so much pain. She's screaming out. And Stan says... She just saved your deputies' lives. That's why she's wearing less clothes. It's to help block the current from going to others. <laughs> well, why well, ain't like the other cops? The other southern cops kissing a priest's toes on Sundays and raking in bribes from the carny six days a week. I ain't that. Sir, is your name Jera? Jer J J J Jeremiah J J J Jude? Yeah. A matter of the utmost importance. If I could just have a moment of your time, a message has come through, and I think you're going to want to hear it. And not in front of these people. Not in front of these cop folks. Please, sir. And the sheriff says, nobody leaves. Everybody stay until I'm done. And he walks over to the corner with Stan, and the two start talking. My name is Stanton Carlisle, Marshal Jude, and my family Scott. Scots are gifted with what old folks called second sight. Now, it's clear to me that you are a man that's generally distrustful, but also fiercely loyal. I would say that's a fair description. And this is none of my business, and I know you're more than capable of handling your own affairs and anything else, but I do sense a childhood, marred in disease, uh, and it makes you feel trapped, even in this day. And you, you carry something, you've been carrying it for a long time, a memento, if you will, and, uh, uh, who's Mary? A saintly woman I'm seeing. My, my, um, my mother. May I see the memento, sir? And he pulls out his necklace from under his clothes. Yes, yes, and she wants you to know that your ailment has not shunned you from greatness, that your community loves you and feels protected by you, sir. And yes, you couldn't serve your country on foreign soil, but you, you protect us here at home. And this medal, this medal should be a reminder of her love and her love for you as long as you keep it close, close to your heart. Lord Jesus will protect you. What? At this point, Sheriff Jude, he's got stars in his eyes. He's in love with this man, and he's in love with what he's hearing. He looks like a man that just had a revelation. And she wants you to know, sir, that it's only by being merciful to others that a man has true power. And with that, Stan was able to save the carny. Even Clem, the owner of the carny, is like impressed. He's, you know, everyone's asking, how did you do it, Stan? Pete used to say it wasn't about the clothes. It was about the shoes. They tell you a lot about the man, the shoes. He had a lift in his right shoe, and I bet that he had polio as a kid. Means no military. And I could tell by the look in his eyes, he was a mama's boy. I saw that chain around his neck, I thought religious, and I just assumed, you know, he must know someone named Mary. And would you look at that? His what? mom's name was fucking Mary. In the world? There was cheers, applause everywhere. Meanwhile, that was all Molly needed to know. A life outside with Stan would work. 
She told him she's ready to go with him and Stan is over the moon. He feels like he finally found something, something that he's good at. And you know, Molly's like, and I know you'll always look after me, right? As long as you let me, I'll take care of you. What about Xena? Is she gonna be upset? Oh, because Pete's gone? She'll be fine, she's lived, she knows what's what. Well, everyone knows that you're the only one that I've been into and the only reason I've stuck around. And with that, Molly brings in Stan for a kiss and they're getting heated. And Molly confesses that she's never done it with a man before, at least not that any that she said yes to. And with that, the two pack their bags and head off. Stan asks Zena if she wants some, um, the book back. And she says, no, you earned it. But the way she says it, it's very cryptic. Like you earned it as in he killed Pete to get it or he earned it because he was such a good student. I don't know, like it, it wasn't a genuine you earned it. It was almost implying something. Mm -hmm. So the happy couple, they drive off with their trunk filled with their things and they go for a new and better life. And they start studying the book for two years straight. They're studying, playing in clubs, playing in these little jazz bars, memorizing the words and the numbers. And now they've made it in two years. They were able to climb from random CD bars in New York City to the top of the top cocktail bars where judges, politicians, lawyers, doctors mingle together. And Molly, she's still studying one day when Stan falls asleep in their fancy apartment and he's got a dream, a flashback if you will, to the very beginning where his dad is laying in bed and Stan says, Dad, you're going now, but I need you. And then he wakes up from his nap on the couch and Molly's like, Stan, are you okay? Yeah, keep going. We got two shows tomorrow. And their shows were impressive. Okay, they are rubbing shoulders with the upper elite in Manhattan. I'm talking the richest of the richest. And they're killing it. But it's clear that their honeymoon phase of this relationship is over. Stan gets upset if Molly even messes up a little in their show. He tells her to get it together. Now, it's easy to notice that in the first and second show, someone stands out, a woman, a blonde woman who decides to stay for both the shows. This blonde woman looks full of grace. She looks full of class. She is Kate Blanchett, but she goes by Lilith in the movie. And she watches curiously as Molly grabs people's items and asks questions to Stan. And he guesses the correct object while he's blindfolded on stage. So exactly what Pete originally did to him, the number mm -hmm. thing, right? And in the second show, this woman, Lilith, stands up. I would like to go next, but I would like to hold the object myself. Very well. Mr. Carlyle, what does this woman possess in her hands? Well, I guess it's a, it's a knight of gold, a golden handbag. And the room bursts into applause. Molly is about to talk, but Lilith walks around and loudly tells the room, be quiet, my child. Let me ask the questions. What is inside the handbag? Stan takes off his blindfold, confused. Madam, what is the meaning of all of this? You say you are genuine, but I say you use verbal signals of some sort to communicate. And the crowd gasps. Ma'am, there, there are no tricks involved. Madam, I assure you that. Then answer me. What is inside my handbag, Mr. Carlyle? The usuals are inside that bag. Lipstick, a handkerchief. Oh, but that's easy enough, is it not? The crowd giggles a bit, but it feels tense. Ladies and gentlemen, I have never met this woman before, nor do I have any prior knowledge to the contents of that purse, and yet, yet there is something very interesting in there. A small pistol, nickel-plated, ivory handle. May I? She snaps open her bag, never breaking eye contact, and plops the gun right onto his palm. Mm -hmm. And the crowd bursts into applause. But he's not done because she came after him, so he's gonna go after her. You claim that you carry it to defend yourself, but I think you do it because you like, you like it. I think you do it because it makes you feel powerful. Well, madam, you're not powerful. Not powerful enough, that is. And he hands her the gun back, and she's going back to her seat to sit down, but he's not done, he's still out for blood. You're an only child, are you not? Your mother died when you were young? Her shadow looms a little too close for comfort. Not a day went by where she didn't crush you down in small ways. And that gun, that gun in your purse, 
Well, sometimes you have dark thoughts about yourself, don't you? Obviously, Lilith isn't into this. She is not responding to that, okay? But stands on a high. And this is when he starts really breaking into shut-eye territory, the gray area, you know? And he puts his hand on the man sitting next to Lilith in this swanky cocktail bar. Sir, you had a recent loss, haven't you? Oh, God, Julian? Sir, he's standing right next to you, rest resting his hand on your shoulder. He wants to know something. He wants you to know something. How proud of you he is. And how... And Stan starts hyperventilating and shaking and his whole body drops to the ground and he passes out. He pretends to, of course. He doesn't know what else to say, so that's how you end the act. <laughs> and Molly rushes to his side and the crowd bursts into applause. They're standing up thinking that he passed out from being spook spoken to, touched by the spirits. He passed out from exhaustion. And then Molly and Stan, they stand while they're being cheered on and they take a bow and they rush into their dressing room and Molly is fucking pissed. What was that about? I don't know. You see how that woman came after me? I saw how you went after her and then that man. What are you talking about? I got us out of the trap. Why did you have to keep going then? I had to. Crowd would have turned on us. When she came after me, I had to take her down. Why are you so concerned about her? I gave you the initials of that watch and you turned it into a goddamn spook show. Molly, did you just see the same show that I did? Crowd was on its feet. I mean, when was the last time it happened? Stan, that woman was sitting at the table with the poor old man and I've seen her here before. When? And there's a knock on the door. It's them. Then I won't go see them, no big deal. Yes, you will, you will go see them and you'll tell that poor old man that you, you spooked him. Tell him the truth, let him off the hook. Oh. It's a spook show. Oh, like Pete used to tell people the truth. Yeah, like sorry I did that, I went overboard. Oh. It was just for shits and giggles, I took a guess. Yes, you will, go see him, tell him the truth. All right, truth. In and out. Fine, Molly, you happy? And the couple walk out and the whole bar and cocktail lounge is empty. But Charles Kimball is the old rich man that's waiting to meet them. Meanwhile, Lilith, the blonde woman, is at the bar watching astutely. She's side-eyeing the fuck out of them. Sorry to keep you waiting, sir. No, 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 not at all. I, I'm Charles Kimball and I was hoping to engage you for a private consultation. Uh, Charles, what you experience tonight, I will double your nightly rate. Well, that's not the point. The thing is, <laughs> is that lady with you? And the blonde woman joins them at the table. Charles wanted my opinion before engaging with you. <sighs> Molly says, well, sorry, we, don't, we just don't do private consultations. Molly, please. I think you want an apology, Mr. Carlyle. So the blonde lady is selling this, Lilith. An apology for trying to call him out on his own show. Why would I want an apology? You provided us quite a show here tonight, so thank you. And he turns to Charles Kimball and he says, You seek solace? Yes. I think we can provide that for you just this once. Oh God. Thank you, thank you. And Charles writes down his home address on Lilith's business card and makes an appointment for 4.30 p.m. on Wednesday. Everyone seems content, but not Molly. Molly seems fucking pissed. When Stan looks down at the card that Charles wrote and he's looking at the address and he's also looking at Dr. Lilith Carter, psychiatrist. And Stan is intrigued, but Molly is beyond pissed and Stan doesn't care. He's thinking bigger. He thinks if he partners with Dr. Lilith, they can do some wild things in this town. Very wild things. With her connections, her knowledge, with his abilities, they can make so much money. So he makes an unannounced visit to her office, but she was already waiting for him. Her office is grand, beautiful wood flooring. I'm talking Great Gatsby style. Adornments on the wall, the light sconces are beautiful. I mean, it probably costs a mortgage. The dream psychiatrist office. Mr. Carlyle, what brings you here? You left me your card, didn't you? So here we are. She hands him a drink. Oh no, I never drink, never have. He glances at her desk at the knobs protruding out. Most would assume it's a design choice, but he knocks on them. Microphones. That's right. Wired recorder. Are you recording this? No. My office is wired to record all analysis sessions. You got a smoother line, you know, but you run a racket just like me. 
Meaning she's a hustler just like him. Mm. Is that what this is? How did you know I had a pistol? I can read a mark pretty quick. And I'm a mark, am I? What do I want? To be found, same as everyone else. Is that it? Find out what people want, health, wealth, love. Find out what it is and sell it back to them, is that it? As long as you don't oversell it, you know? You wanna know how I knew about that gun? I removed my blindfold for dramatic effect and to get a rise out of the audience. But also, your elbow was bent forward, meant clutch was heavy. You were holding it with your left hand, no wedding ring, no tan mark, unmarried. You liked to go out at night, obviously. You were at the lounge. But I assume you like to go to lower class places once in a while, don't you? Well, you live alone, no man in the house, gotta have a gun at home. But I assume a pretty lady like yourself wouldn't have a big gun. Something small, portable, a 22, 25, a pistol for sure. And since you like pretty things, Nickel-plated ivory handle. But you talked about my mother. Why? Well, women like you always have mommy issues. Daddy issues, too, but... I see. An electro complex? I wouldn't know about that. But you're not as hard to read as you think you are. If I'm so easy to read, why did you come see me, then? Judge Kimball. That judge? Pretty big deal, isn't he? Yeah. Doesn't get much bigger than Judge Kimball. What do you want? He's a patient of yours? Friend of my father's. Y'all jazzy together? AKA, are y'all sleeping together? And she's like, now why would you ask that? Because you have a handle on him. His wife is a patient of mine. Interesting woman, Felicia. Have you ever been in an analysis, psychiatric session? No, I wouldn't know what to talk about. Simple, what are you thinking about? No, no. You? Me? What about me? Come a little closer so I can get a better look at you. And it's like sexual tense, okay? It's like <sighs> very sexually tense, like they're totally gonna do it. And he's like, no, I'm just thinking if you can help me, we can make quite a big debt in this town. We? Oui. You give me something on that judge or any of the other higher ups and I will make it worth your while. You think you got something big enough or interesting enough to make it good enough for me? Come on, Lilith. Nothing in this town matters more than money, and you know that. All right. I'll give you something in exchange for the truth about yourself. I give you a little information, and you tell me the truth. And the two shake hands. And what does that mean, the truth? She wants to um, do an evaluation on him. A psychiatric evaluation on him. What? Yeah. Why? Oh, just you wait. Oh. And don't lie. I will know if you're lying. That's it? Then go. Judge Kimball lost a son, an only child, Julian. 23 years old, Julian enlisted against Felicia's wishes in the army and died in no man's land. Okay. I can work with that. And that night, the couple has another show, but Molly is definitely pulling away. She's getting no love, no support. She's just a supporting actress. Literally everyone rush, rushes to take pictures of Dr. Car or Mr. Carlyle, not knowing how important she is to the whole act. Mm -hmm. They think that she's just a random assistant that can be replaced. Mm. He barely sp spends any time with her. He's changed. He's become power hungry, obsessed with money. He's losing his mind. He's hanging out all the time with Lilith, leaving Molly alone, and she's just lost her sparkle. She misses the carnival. Because at least at the carnival, it felt like family. But she's stuck now. She's in too deep. Meanwhile, Stan goes to Dr. Lilith's office to get hypnotized. Well, not hypnotized, but analyzed, like he promised. In exchange for, you know, her telling him information about the Kimballs. It's nighttime. The lights are glimmering in New York. The skyline is beautiful. Oh my god, it looks like poo-poo. Oh no. Can you try it? It doesn't smell sweet. I feel like it's gonna be a not-so-sweet. Mmm. Not too sweet? Not too sweet. I'm Very so sick good. of these not too sweet desserts. Mm. Someone get me a sweet dessert. It's good. So the lights are dim. The New York skyline is glimmering in the background. It's vibey. Stan is sitting on the chase. Lilith on a plush velvet armchair. And with the click of a button, the recording devices turn on and she's ready to go. When I offered you a drink, you said you never drank. Because I don't. But you made it a point of pride. You could have taken the glass and not drunk at it. You could have taken it and said not right now and set it aside. You, sh you could have said no thank you. But instead you said, no, not me. I never drink. Mm. 
you can't do mentalism and be drunk. You gotta be on your toes all the time. When you're on, you're on. And you're on now? I'm always on, doctor. Did your father drink? Yes. When I poured the whiskey, you winced. Why? That's not something I would like to talk to you about. The truth, remember? We shook on it. I don't like the way it smelled, that's all. You were 12 feet away. It smelled off, like wood alcohol. You've had wood alcohol before? No, not me, never. Never. It's that word again. Please lie down, please. So Stan puts out a cigarette and lies down on the chase. A guy I knew drank wood alcohol, and he died. What are you thinking about now? It makes no sense. Pianos. Elaborate. My mother. Did she play the piano? What does that have to do with anything? Did she drink? And as Stan closes his eyes, Lilith walks over and starts rubbing her fingers, tracing the ridges of his face. Very interesting and very sexual. If my therapist or psychiatrist did that to me, mm -mm, I'm filing a report. <laughs> why, are you, why are you caressing my face right now? Because now I'm confused. Are we dating? <laughs> or what? I don't know. It's weird. Who played the piano? Guy named Humphreys. He was a friend of my folks. How old was the man who died at the carnival? What did you say his name was? I, I didn't say. Or at least I don't think I said. And as he tries to get back up, Lilith brings his head back down and he whispers, Pete, how did Pete get the alcohol? I gave it to him, but it was a mistake. Mistake? Was, what was he to you? Did you admire him, pity him? Did he teach you things? Yes. He was old, wasn't he? Old enough to be your father. And with that, a flashback to the dingy house where the fire was set and Stan wakes up from the chair. I think we're done now. Did you ever stutter as a child? Because you have a slight compulsory movement. Your head moves up and down ever so slightly. And Humphreys, was he ever inappropriate or abusive with you? And he starts screaming, shut your mouth, shut your mouth. Humphreys took away my mother because my father wasn't man enough to hold on to her. All right, are you happy? Always holding a Bible selling Jesus. And what do you sell? I'm a hustler, okay? And I know it. I'm nothing like my old man and I'll never be. Never. That word again. We're going to work on that. Weird. Because it didn't feel like Stan would be back for a very long time. I mean, she was really pushing his buttons. So he rushes home, opens the door to see Molly hanging out with Xena and her two closest friends from the carnival. Friends of her dad's. Bruno and another guy. And she rushes up to kiss Stan and whispers, I invited them. Sorry. Are you mad? No. Why would I be? And with that, they turn on some music, order some food, giggle, gaggle, they're having fun. Meanwhile, Stan and Xena sit on the side like old times. You're doing really well, Stan. Yeah, same griff, different threads now. Don't do the spook show. Don't do it. So he's thinking, does she know about Charles Kimball, the appointment that he's got coming up soon? Mm-hmm. Is that why she called you? What? No, Molly didn't tell me. It's all in the cards. We'll save it for the chump, Xena. Fine. Then you do it. Xena slams her cards down and Stan flips over the first card. Downfall. Impending danger. That's what it says, Stan. Another card. An urgent choice. Now, Stan, the next card that you flip is the last. It's a decree. You turn it and you find out what's coming to you. And he flips another card. Xena's face looks serious. The hanged man. Upside down. But you can still choose what you do. Well, you said so yourself. There's no such thing as bad cards, remember? Just depends on what you do with it. And Stan turns the hanged man around so it's no longer hanging. See? I fixed it. And with that, Stan is doing the spook show. He shows up at the Kimball's fancy Manhattan estate and he starts with Mrs. Kimball. He sits her down and tells her dramatically. He closes his eyes. He loves you so much. Even if you guys didn't see eye to eye all the time. Oh, oh yes. That's, that's true. We didn't see eye to eye. May I touch the photograph of him? Maybe it'll bring me deeper with him. Stan closes his eyes, tracing his fingers, and he starts twitching. He died suddenly. But he wants you to know that he was in no pain. He wants you to know that it hurts him so, so very much that you guys miss him, that you guys are in pain. Because he wants you to know that with absolute certainty that you will all be together again in no time. 
Is he here? Is he here? Can I speak to him? And dramatically, Stan grabs her hand and puts it to his chest. And she cries out in pain. Talking about the grief she feels that he's gone. Overall, it was quite a successful session. So where does Stan go? If he wants to keep up the spook show, yeah, you guessed it. Dr. Lilith, how are you? You should have seen Kimball. I mean, I think he'll be talking about it for the rest of his life. And every time that they bring it up or they talk about it, it'll just get better and better, bigger and bigger, because that's what happens. A toast, then, to your success, Carlisle. And she holds up a glass of alcohol, which he ignores. He, uh, he asked me to see one of his friends. And who might that be? He didn't say, but I'm considering it. Tell you what, you got a safe? And she nods, and he drops a big chunk of cash. It was the payment from Charles Kimball. Keep it for me for a few days, and then you can decide if you want to go 50-50. Besides, don't want Molly knowing about the spook show anyway. And as she takes the cash, they're so close to each other's faces. I mean, they could basically kiss. I, could, I would count that as an affair, I'm going to be honest. It was intense. And later, she calls him right before he performs another lounge. Hello? The man. The friend Kimball wants to introduce you to is Ezra Grindle. Grindle was a patient of mine for a brief time. He's unstable, unpredictable. How is he fixed on cash, though? Very rich, very powerful, and intense, private. Dealings with Grindle have consequences, permanent ones. Well, you better give me an angle, then. And Stan is driven up to meet with Mr. Grindle in a mansion that looks more like an entire castle. And the security is probably higher than that of the Buckingham Palace or even the White House. I mean, it's insane. Coats, keys, pockets. Emptied here. Okay, it sounds like TSA. <laughs> no pencils, no pens, keys, cigarettes, or lighters inside. Hands up. I need your watch and your ring. He is straight up getting a pat down before he's escorted into a deep, deep hallway where he meets... Ezra Grindle, sitting in an empty, long, lavish hallway, Great Gatsby vibes, on a random chair. Mr. Carlyle, I'm Ezra Grindle. Let me take your coat. It wasn't a question, more of a demand. Thank you for coming to see me. Take a seat. And right when he sits, a giant machine gets wheeled out and there's three dudes in suits. I mean, the, the giant machine looks like it's from the future. It's a giant box with knobs and turns everywhere. What, what is that? What the heck? Are you familiar with the polygraph? This is our version. We call it a lie detector. And you want to you, you perform this on me. That's the general idea, yeah. Stan is calm, but he laughs it off. While two men in suits tell him, this will measure your blood pressure, respiration, and voluntary muscle contractions. Not really sure how comfortable I am with this. Well, we do have our fair share of snake charmers in the past, and we deal with them, so please raise your arms. Can you watch my tie, please? Jesus. And what happens if I fail? And Grindle says, one thing at a time. Hmm? We will ask you simple questions to establish your baseline, and please respond with what you believe to be the absolute truth. Now let's get sh started, shall we? Absolute truth, I can do that. Now, brief as you can, what is your name? Stanton Carlisle. Good. What day is today? Wednesday, I think. Very well now. And as briefly as you can, are you a true medium? Yes, I am. Can you read minds? Yes, I can, under the right circumstances. Keep your answers brief, please. Are you in contact with the beyond? Stanton closes his eyes, pauses. Everyone looks as if he's about to fess up for lying, but instead he raises his hand dramatically, eyebrows crinkled like he's focusing very hard on taking a poo. Before we go on, you must know there is a presence in this room right now. It's a, it's a female presence, and she's just insisting, insisting that she communicate with somebody, that they communicate through me. Oh my, she's passed away many, many years ago. There was, a, there was a life extinguished within her. It was a baby. A child in her. You forced her to miscarry, did you not? Mr. Grindle? Shall I go on? Mr. Grindle looks pissed plus shocked plus scared, okay? Should I go on, Mr. Grindle? And he's like, no, no, there's no need. A word in my office, gentlemen. And with that, they all shuffle out of the hallway intensely. Meanwhile, Stan is sitting there nervously because he can hear Grindle screaming at them. Did you fine tune it well? Two wrong, two right, answer me. You brought him straight from the club. How could he know that? How? Answer me right now. 
I presume it went well because he was allowed to leave and he goes straight to Lilith. Well, Lilith. I got him hooked real good. Despite all that, he's not, uh, he's got quite the operation. So will you be going back? Oh yeah, he's gonna call back. You're gonna have to give me some real information on him now though. No, not me. I'm the only one that could have given you that information. If your foot slips, we both fall. And with that, Lilith opens a secret door into the bathroom while Stan gets up to go to her secret storage key, which is hanging from the cabinet, the one that holds all the files on everyone, even the audio recordings of all the people's sessions. And he walks over to copy the key in one of those, um, it's like a pocketbook, but it's felt. Yeah. So you put the key in and it copies it. He stole her key, basically. Yes. Okay. But in the meantime, he's talking to her about how she shouldn't be worried, that they will never trace it back to her. He's desperate. So he's not thinking clearly. No. Um, wait, sorry. That they'll never trace it back to her. But as he lets the chain down softly, it sounds like Lilith can hear it. And she comes out and says, The thing you need to know is if you displease the wrong people, the world closes in on you very, very fast. And she takes off her jacket to, to show her boobies, and there is a giant scar cut around her left breast and going down her stomach. What? Literally circling her breast and going down her stomach. What? Yeah. Meaning what like that? she messed with the wrong people and she got hurt. Oh. And Stan comes up to trace it with his hands. What happened to you? Life. Life happened to me. And from there, Stan gets on his knees to kiss her scars. Like, what? Excuse me, sir, you have a wife. And he's going to screw her over anyway. So he uses the key that he copied to get into her office after hours and use the recording device to listen to Grindel's patient sessions. He listens to it in her office, like the audacity of this guy. Grindel is talking about how he claims he couldn't even claim the dead lover's body. So he was having an affair and got her pregnant. She died during the abortion and he couldn't even claim her body. Because then it would reveal what he did. It would ruin him professionally with his family. So he left the body to be unclaimed. And he's sobbing, talking about how she had to go to a commoner's grave. We see then Stan using this information to find death records on this woman for the date that Grindle said. And found out that her name was Doris and found more personal information about her. Now, now he's ready for when Grindle calls. And Grindle does call. Hiya, thanks for coming again. I just want to get straight into it. I wanted to see what impression you got from the, um, the girl that showed up during the test. I, I didn't see her. She didn't materialize. But by that means that she could. It was very brief, Mr. Grindle. Call me Ezra, please. I sense profound sadness and regret. She loved you, and that boy, that baby boy. It was a boy? Is she with me right now? She's never far. This garden. So he's got this giant garden. Like, I'm talking Getty Museum, like Griffith Observatory. Gar no, not Griffith Observatory. You, the Getty Garden or something, right? It's huge. She's never far from this place, this garden. Is it important? I built it to honor her. The paths and the benches you see, she would have loved it. She does. She loves it. I can sense it, Brother Ezra. And he puts his hand on Ezra's shoulder. She's trying to tell me something, but it doesn't make any sense. It gets jumbled sometimes. It's like that when they try to communicate with me. The letter D, 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 Doris, D, Dory. Grindle sits down on the bench crying. Dory, my Dory. You have to, I have to see her. I have to, whatever it takes. I want you to, I, I want you to, materialize her. Yeah. Do you have any idea what type of commitment that would have to be? I can give you $10,000 for every session. Mr. Grindle, your sins are grave. You would have to work hard spiritually if you even want to see her, even have the chance to see her. Listen, I have more money than I will ever need, but I have no hope. You think you can buy hope? And suddenly, Mr. Grindle smirks. He went from desperate to smirking, and he says, well, not to be crude, but I know I can. And he stops crying and laughs before getting up. And his handyman comes up to him to hand him a big wad of cash. And they walk off, leaving Stan alone in the garden, waiting for his car to come pick him up. He brings it back to Lilith's office and she puts it in the safe. And the two of them start talking about bringing her back to life. They think maybe Molly can play the part. Molly looks very, very much like Dory. 
She'll need to be staged in blood. The more shocking the image, the less inclined he will be to question it. And Lilith brings a cup to her lips, drinks the liquor, and goes in to make out with Stan. After their kiss, he goes to pick up the glass of whiskey and downs it all. Hmm? Yeah, he's drinking now. What? Mm-hmm. Why? Because he feels unstoppable. To us. Okay. And it's a bizarre moment. So I think the feeling is his dad was an alcoholic and lost his life to alcoholism. Mm -hmm. But with Stan, now that he... I think maybe he was scared of alcohol because he didn't want to go down that same path. Mm -hmm. But he... Now, at this point in his life, he believes he's above human. Mm. He believes he has total control over him and the people around him, and he is a legend. You know what I mean? He's getting too cocky. He's, it's the FTX effect, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, it's a bizarre moment. Okay, it's weird. But then he goes back home and he starts trying to ease Molly into the idea. He shows her the pictures that he found of Doris, Grindel's dead lover, and she died like 40 years ago, but she died young. And she looks exactly like Molly, just with longer black hair. So I'm going to materialize you, Molly, in a seance, and he can unburden his soul and forgive himself. No, not me. As far as I can tell, that's what a preacher does every Sunday. And it worked with Judge Kimball. I saved, I saved the Kimball marriage. I think Grindel really loved her, Stan. You can see that, can't you? All that suffering that he had, we can finally deliver him some hope. But before Molly can answer, Grindel's right-hand man comes to knock on the door, so of course Molly has to go hide because she's going to materialize later. Mm -hmm. And he sits down and says, he wants to see you again. Of course he does. You want a cup of coffee first? And the right-hand man looks around. I don't know why he bothers with you. You're a real cheap pal, just phony. But I'll tell you this, I care for that man. I owe him a lot, and if you're smart, that should scare you. Stan was not smart, nor did he care. He kept eating his toast while barely listening to the guy. And now that he's back with Grindel, he keeps talking to him. She, she says you lied. You lied to her, you gave her a false name, and you left her body behind. And that pisses Grindel off enough, and that he snaps his hands back away from Stan. So they were holding hands. Ezra, you can't break the circle. We have to keep our hands together. Don't break the circle. It takes patience. I want to see her, Stan. I want to talk to her. I've given you a fortune. Now it's time that you delivered something other than guilt hearing this endless resuscitation of what I know, what the fuck I did, and what I'm going to do. If this goes on much longer, well, you'll just find out what happens to you. Jeez. So Stan goes home and buys Molly a wig. Can you ask for more time, Stan? I need more time. We're out of time, Molly. Now wear this, and this is the position that you'll resume. Hands down by your side, arms open, okay? And he has the drawing, just like the execution chair. So she's looking at the drawing, and Stan goes to the bathroom. And she's slipping through the book, and she sees a drawing of Lilith, the doctor. The one that she had no idea that they were still in communication. He's drawing another woman. What? Stan told her when they first met that he draws whatever is on his mind. Meanwhile, in the Kimball house, the judges, you know, the one that lost their son, they're having a delicious breakfast in their lush Manhattan apartment. They seem to be back in love, happy, finally at peace. And Mrs. Kimball says, Charles? Yes, my love. I've been thinking about what Mr. Carlyle said about us being reunited with Julian. Do you remember? Yes, yes I do, my love. Well, and she gets up smiling, pulls out a gun and shoots him straight in the head. Then she sits down smiling. Oh, Julian. And points the gun at her head and takes her own life. You know, when he said that during the thing, he yeah. said you guys will be united very soon. Yeah. I thought about this too. Like, what do you mean united very yeah. soon? I guess because they were older, so like very soon could be 30 years, you know? Oh, it sounds it sounded like a curse mm -hmm. at that moment too. Wow, so he basically killed them. Basically. Wow. She took her own life because she genuinely believed that they will be reunited very soon. And this is what she had to do. She convinced herself she had to do this. This is what Julian would have wanted. I don't think Stan has any idea what he's done, not yet at least. He has other problems, because he comes home to find the entire place empty of Molly's things and a letter on the table. Dear Stan, by the time you read this, I will be eastbound. I won't do what you want me to. I can't. I've loved you the best I can for as much as I can, and I know now that it'll never be enough. Whatever is missing in you, it sure isn't me. 
It's hard to accept it, but as much as the truth hurts, I need it. And maybe in time, you'll need it too. Molly. And Stan grabs a glass of liquor, shoots it down before heading to the bus station and finds Molly who's about to board the train. Molly, please, please talk to me. I just want to talk to you for a second. No, you smell like booze. Leave me alone. You can't leave. We're in too deep. There is no we anymore. There hasn't been for a very long time. I don't know who you're seeing on the side, but you're certainly not fucking me anymore. I bet it's that frozen-faced bitch you were so impressed with. I bet she seems class to you, but she's not, and neither are you. Molly, please, I was just trying to get the inside spook because she don't, you don't want to do the spook show. Please, this is the last time, I promise, and everything is Christmas after that. I'm scared, Stan. I'm scared too, Molly. I'm so scared I can't even breathe. I'm so scared every damn day of my life. Sometimes you don't see the line until you cross it, and I crossed it, and I can see that now. Molly, please, everyone has left me in my life. Don't leave me too, please. And with that, they sneak into Grindel's garden, unlock one of the side gates, and Molly is waiting in the car, depressed, as Grindel's long-lost lover in olden day clothes, and he tries to explain. I'm gonna go bring him out to the garden at exactly eight. No earlier, no later. You're gonna walk through the gate about, about 20 paces towards him. When he sees you, I will tell him to get down on his knees and pray. When he closes his eyes, you walk out and then we're done, okay? Okay. Remember when we used to do the shows back then? Remember how the current would go through my body and you know how I could take it? The first few days my muscles would cramp for so long and it would hurt so bad. But then I tried to make myself let go and go numb. I would tell myself to go really numb. But it was always just really clear to me when I've had enough electricity. And I knew when I just couldn't take it. And Stan, I've had enough. I'll be there at eight and I'll do what you'd want me to. But I'm done after. So it seems like they're not getting back together afterwards, regardless. Even if he stops the spook shows, like she's had enough. So Stan doesn't respond, instead he just walks out and goes to the memorial that he set up in the garden. This is the night that they're going to see her, they're trying to, but Grindel is having cold feet. I, I don't blame you, but I must be honest. Stan, you told me to purge my soul from my sins and I haven't done that. There are things I've done that I haven't told anyone before. It's okay, Ezra, you're gonna purge yourself now. Be still, put your hand on me and tell me. Oh, no, I can't. Tell her, tell her. God, please don't make... Dory... Dory, through the years, I've hurt many young women. I don't know why. I guess I've just been seeking you in them, or I was seeking to rid my soul of this anger. What did you do? I don't know. I hurt them. I hurt them. And then he opens his eyes to see Dory walking through the garden, blood all over her hands and dress. Oh my God! She's there! She's there! But instead of praying, Grindel runs straight to Molly. Which, like, why didn't they not think this through? I would have immediately thought that's what he would have done, no? Yeah. Who just sees his long-lost dead one that he wanted to see for decades now and doesn't run straight to her. Mm -hmm. He hugs her legs so that she can't move, she can't leave. Meanwhile, the right-hand man that threatened Stan heard on the radio inside the house that the Kimballs have died in an apparent murder-suicide, and he knows that the Kimballs recommended Grindel to Stan, so he's rushing out, and Grindel realizes that Molly is just a fucking random girl pretending to be Dory, and when he realizes this, he threatens to destroy the both of them, and he punches Molly in the face. Oh. Stan Defends Molly by punching Grindel in the face one too many times until he's dead. What about the right hand man? Right hand man is running out. It's a big house. Molly is yelling oh. at him to stop and when he finally does it seems like Grindel might be dead. He tells Molly to run to turn the car on and they drive off and the right hand man shows up to shoot at them and he runs him over. What? He runs him over, reverses and runs him back over killing the both of them. What? He just yeah. killed two people like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they stop in the middle of nowhere and Molly is so pissed when they finally stop, she slaps him across the face and walks off. And he's screaming, Molly, where are you going, Molly? We can't go back to the hotel. She doesn't look back. She keeps walking. And he screams after her, I don't need you, Molly. I don't need you. And he goes over to Lilith's place and he takes his cash and he tries to leave. She's putting the cash in his duffel bag for him and he's downing glasses of liquor and making out with Lilith. And as he's about to walk out the door, she says, I do love you, Stan. 
and it makes him tense up and freeze. And suddenly, she laughs and, did I oversell it? And with a smirk, she turns on the recording device. Patient Stanton Carlisle, final therapy session. What are you doing? He throws his bag down and opens it up. All the money are singles, they're dollar bills. They used to be hundred dollar bills. And now, the outer layers of each stack are a hundred dollars and mm. everything in the middle are singles. Okay. Where's the money? Where did you put it? You took the money. What are you saying, Mr. Carlyle? Try to understand that these delusions are becoming part of your condition. You crazy bitch. I will tell them everything we did. Did what? Tell me. We did together. What are you talking about? Have we seen each other other than in this very office? Cut it out. What are you doing? You came unannounced, my secretary allowed you in, and I did everything I could, but it seems you've made a transference to me, both as your mistress and as your mother. I have tried to avert a serious upset, but it seems that I have failed. The symbolism is quite obvious, isn't it, Mr. Carlyle? You have a very peculiar relationship to older men, Ezra Grindle, for example, but also the man you claim to have killed at the carnival. Why are you doing this? You don't even care about the money. Lilith turns off the recording and laughs. You are such a di disappointment. And you're right. The money doesn't matter to me, but it means everything to you, doesn't it? You're a small, small man. You don't fool people. Stand, they fool themselves. You think you stand high above the common man? You're nothing. You think you could take me, Stan? You're so blind, aren't you? You can't read the signs. Didn't you notice? My clutch was heavy. And she takes the gun out of her clutch and shoots him in the face but it just grazes his ear and he's not dead. Am I powerful enough for you now, Stan? And while Stan is on the ground bleeding, she runs to her phone. Please, security, there's a patient of mine. I need help immediately. Stan stands up and grabs Lilith and starts strangling her with the phone cord while trying to wrestle the gun away from her. Stan, you think you can take my breath away? And she laughs. And as he's strangling her, the door opens and the security runs in and starts chasing after him in the hallway, but not before asking, You all right, doctor? She says, I'll live. And a huge chase ensues where Stan jumps aboard a train filled with chickens in cages and he hides behind the chickens well enough that they don't see him and the train takes off and he lays there, looking so similarly to a broken man. And while on the train, he has a flashback to his dad lying on the bed sickly. Stan leans down and says, By the way, Dad, I've always hated you. And he opens up all the windows in the cold winter, takes his dad's blanket, and watches the man shiver to death. Whoa. And then he kills him, burns him. Then we get a flash forward. Many weeks later, Stan is completely unshaven, looks completely different, wobbling out of a wooden trailer to join a group of men without homes by the fire. He's got holes in his shoes, he has to cover them up with newspaper, his clothes are beyond dirty, and a strange man offers him some liquor. For a price, no more mooching. And with that, Stan is dead in his eyes, takes off his watch and hands it to them. So now, a completely broken man. He travels back to the carnival looking for a job. But it's a new carnival, not the same boss. And he stumbles inside, and he interviews with him. And he takes a shot of liquor with the carnival owner. And he says, I'm not looking for a mentalist. Those, those are the old days, okay? We don't do that shit here. No one likes it. Look, one carny to another. <sighs> you reek a bruise, okay? But as a friend, listen, I do have one job. And you don't have to take it. It's temporary, but it's a job. You could take it for a while. I got a nice dry place to sleep hot meals. And a, and a shot now and then. It's only temporary, though. Till we get a real geek. You know what a geek is? Stan nods. So what do you say? You think he can handle it? And Stan starts crying, sobbing. And then he starts laughing at the irony. Mister, Mister, I was born for it. And he starts crying in defeat and laughing at the irony of it all. Stan knew better than to take this job. He knew what it meant. He knew his fate, but it was too late. He was lying at the bottom of the pit, and there was no way out. And that's the end. Oh. So good, no? Wow. So good. Wow. 
but there's more connection. So people say, why did Lilith betray him? I mean, it seemed like she really was developing a fond relationship with him, but Lilith seems to have a burning hatred for egotistical, powerful men or people who believe that power is everything. They probably have hurt her in the past and Ezra Grindel was most likely the one that gave her the scar on her chest because he said he did things to women, things that he mm, shouldn't have done. Yeah. So she set this all up to get revenge on Ezra Grindel and Kimball. So she brought Kimball to the lounge and Molly said, I've seen her here before. Mm -hmm. And she knew that this guy, whoever this guy was, Mr. Carlisle Stanton was a hustler. So she's watching him, brings Mr. Kimball, knowing that he had a recent death. She checks him out, does the whole little performance of like, what's in my purse? And that indicates to Kimball that this, is, this guy is the real deal. So she's getting revenge on Kimball for whatever he may have done to her and then revenge on Ezra Grindel because she knew that the two of them are close and that Grindel has got some issues and would be interested in shit like what? this. So mm -hmm. she's the ultimate mentalist. Yes, she's the ultimate mentalist. And it's crazy because it also speaks to the misogyny of the olden days and still now. But um, he's playing with these powerful men. And he thinks that the people that he should be scared of are, are the powerful men. men. But mm. in reality, she uses that to her advantage and gets away with this. He would never suspect her. He thinks that she's a fool that leaves her cabinet unlocked or with the key in the you know, cabinet. It's so interesting. The full ending, cycle. the ending, oh my god, I just wish I could play you the ending clip because the amount of facial emotion, it's Bradley Cooper, the guy that was in American Gangsters or American Hustlers. Bradley Cooper is the main guy? Really oh. good, really good. And Kate Blanchett, she killed it, wow. She conned the con. This was probably one of the better movies that I've seen in a really long time. What are your thoughts? And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Next week, we will be back with a book, bam. So stay tuned, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye! Ha <laughs> ha!